was in 1847 by George Perkins Marsh. In 1988, James E. Henson spoke to the Congress in the United States about climate change. In 1989, the UN released a paper that said that we have a 10-year window of opportunity to deal with climate change. Better. Nothing was done. Last year, there was a, a, the COP22 in, Conf, in um, Paris, 21, sorry, in Paris. And they had an aspirational target of 1.5C, and that they hoped they could uh, hold the temperature rise to, and that the, the overall target was 2C. 2C was neither safe nor achievable, ever. There's a 10 to 30 year lag between cause and effect of when we emit carbon into the atmosphere. The chaos that we're watching now unfold, as we speak now, a whole lot of Christchurch is being evacuated due to a whole lot of fires that are bearing down on the city. The chaos we are seeing unfold now is the result of carbon emissions from last century. There's another 17 years of carbon emissions that are in the pipeline heading straight towards us. One of the side effects of not dealing with climate change up until this point is that we have crossed a multitude of tipping points. Otherwise, they can be referred to as positive reinforcing feedback loops. There are no, nothing positive about this. They're, they are really negative in their outcomes for us. On Guy McPherson's website, guymcpherson.com, here's a monster climate change essay with five dozen positive reinforcing feedback loops on it. What happens with those tipping points is they, 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 they generate their own responses. One of them is the albedo feedback loop in the Arctic. At the moment, the Arctic, it's supposed to be the middle of the winter in the Arctic, and we're expecting the sea ice to be increasing. It's not increasing. It's decreasing. Last year at this time of the year, it was raining in the middle of the winter in, uh, in the Arctic. Recently, we had a temperature anomaly in the Arctic of 25 degrees C. If the average temperature at this time of the year in Auckland was 25 degrees, what would you think if you woke up and it was 50 fucking degrees? <laughs> that is the predicament that we're in. Climate change is not a problem. It is a predicament. Problems have solutions. Predicaments don't. When we talk about fighting climate change, there's a myriad of things that we have to fight. We have to fight colonialism. We have to fight imperialism. We have to fight racism. And climate change is a class issue. It's a class war. In, in December, sorry, in November 2016, Robin Westerner, who blogs at robinwesterner.blogspot.nz, otherwise, otherwise it's called Seymour Rocks Blog, we interviewed uh, Dr. Jim Salinger, who's New Zealand's IPCC representative and, and Nobel Peace Laureate. He won the Nobel Peace Prize with the IPC, IPCC. Jim and I were at a conference in, in, in Hamilton. I wasn't speaking, I was just attending, and Jim was on a panel. And in that in that in that, le that lecture, I said to Jim, when, no, I said to the panel, when is the panel going to admit that we're in abrupt climate change? The non-linear period of climate change. And Jim put his hand up and said, I'll answer that question. He instantly put his hand up, you know, rather than the other members of the panel. And he said, we are in abrupt climate change, and we have been since 2010. What, what does that mean? What does it mean that we are now in a abrupt climate change? Now, I was just about to explain that. Okay, right. This is the linear form of climate change, where it progressively gets worse. When it goes abrupt and becomes exponential, this is the exponential function. If you know anything about the exponential function, you'll be terrified when you think about what's happened to our climate. If you don't know about it, I suggest you go to YouTube and look up a, a presentation by Albert Bartlett about the exponential function. 
one of the great quotes from the presentation is, one of the greatest weaknesses of the human, the human um, species is its inability to understand the exponential function. Hands up anyone here who thinks that climate change could create the collapse of industrial civilization. I'm one of them as well. So, okay, that's ev almost every one of us believes that. One byproduct of the, well, two byproducts I'll talk about. One of them is the loss of global dimming. Has anyone heard of global dimming before? Global dimming is the effect of all the pollution that we have admitted since the beginning of the, of the industrial civilization. All that pollution's gone up into the atmosphere and it is dimming the amount of sunlight, long wave solar radiation that's getting through to the planet. It is keeping us cool, all of that dimming, all of those pollutants. A really good example is on 9-11, three buildings miraculously collapsed in New York. Two plane crashes happened at the same time. As a result of that, whatever happened that day, all of the airplanes in the United States were grounded for quite a few days. One scientist noticed that it was the, the sky was much clearer over, the, over those big cities in the States because there was no planes flying. He checked and there'd been a 1.5 C spike in, in the global temperature, just in, in those, not global temperature, in those areas. When industrial civilization collapses, all those particulates will fall out of the sky and we'll get an instant spike, just like that. A second catastrophic and terrifying thought of when that happens is we get 450 nuclear power station meltdowns. That's a given. If you have collapse, people don't go to work. When Katrina happened in Miami, the first responders didn't turn up. They looked after their families. So the police, the, the um, fire brigade, the ambulance people, they were all, not all, most of them didn't turn up for work. When collapse happens, all of those workers at those nuclear power stations are gonna be staying home, looking after their family and skedaddling out of there. So do you think 450 nuclear power station meltdowns is bad? I've got worse news for you. This is the guy who never gets invited to parties anymore. It's ob for obvious reasons. <laughs> Worse than the 450 nuclear power station meltdowns is the 1,200 spent fuel pool fires that we will have. In every one of those power stations, there are three spent fuel pools. They lift the highly irradiated fuel out of the pressure, pressure vessel, the primary containment vessel, and they plonk them in these pools with water, chilled water that they pump through it. When Fukushima Daiichi happened, on uh, March the 11th, 2011, the power got the, the, the three plants that have melted down and melted through primary and secondary containment. The generators that they'd put in the basements, which are effectively at sea level, right on the ocean, they'd built a seawall sea that wasn't big enough and they, st they knew it wasn't big enough. They'd done all the tests, they'd figured out what the worst possible tsunami that they could have was, they bullshitted on the stats and they built a smaller wall because they could save money. I've been, a, I've been an anti-nuclear activist since 1979 when I was 19 years old, where we were out here blockading the ships coming into this harbour. My worst fears manifested on the 26th of April 1986. By chance, I was walking around in Istanbul and jangles and shorts and a t-shirt in the spring rain. It was beautiful. Chernobyl blew up and they told us that there was no radiation in Turkey. We walked around in it. As a result of that, I don't have children. I made a decision after that not to have children because I'd been irradiated. Then, oh, that's bad enough, then the, my next worst case happened on, at Fukushima Daiichi where we had a triple meltdown and melt through primary and secondary containment. The primary containment vessels are very thick steel, and when the, the, the fuel melted, melted, it went to the bottom of the containment and it melted through the containment. 
The secondary containment is a big concrete pool around the bottom, and that's only really designed to catch leaked water. It's not designed to catch highly irradi irradiated molten radioactive fuel. That's almost certainly burnt through the secondary containment and is now in the artesian waterways underneath the plants. Those, those six, six plants at Fukushima Daiichi, they are built at the bottom of a mountain range where all the water is flowing under those plants and out into the Pacific Ocean. That's been happening now for over 2,000 days. Why is that an issue with climate change? When these superstorms that James E. Hansen has projected will come to us, and you know, he talked about that in his seminal book, the, the Storms of My Grandchildren, they will cause the, the collapse of industrial civilization with also the big spike in temperature which will collapse food production on the planet. And we will have these uh, 1,200 spent fuel pool fires. There's a very strong possibility that they will crash the ozone layer or smash the ozone layer. Carl Sagan talked about, uh, in one of his presentations, you can find it on YouTube, is about a nuclear winter, which would happen if there was a big nuclear exchange. They, they, um, they did a, a study where what would happen if India and Pakistan had a 100 nuclear weapon exchange, and they talked about a nuclear winter. I believe that what will happen, we're in the early stages of runaway climate change, and we have psychopaths at the helm of our sinking ship. Everywhere you look, we see these warmongering bastards going around the world murdering innocent people. I believe that when, we, when this really starts ramping up and we know that the game is up, they will re reach for the nuclear winter. It's an absolutely dystopian hypothesis. It sounds completely outrageous, but ha outrageous? Have a look at the two candidates the United States put up for presidency. One a psychopath and one a sociopath. Pick them. We talk, you talked earlier about uh, how um, with Trump and Clinton. I think, I'm a, I'm a climate change activist. I spend my life on it. I'm actually happier that Trump got in than Clinton because Clinton would have ramped up the wars on our planet. The single largest user of fossil fuels on this planet is the Pentagon the US military industrial complex. It's, it's completely outrageous. Joe Rom, who blogs at Think, Pro, Think, yeah, Think Progress, he wrote, a, he wrote a, a very contentious article based on science that is also contentious, that said that it is possible that historically previous to this time, that there was a 5% temperature increase on this planet in just 13 years. Oliver Takao wrote a paper, uh, wrote a very good, well-researched article in 2008 in The Guardian that said a four degrees temperature rise on this planet is an extinction event for us. Joe Rom thinks we've already had one historically of that, that severity. And I work with a group of scientists called the Arctic Methane Emergency Group. One of them is a guy called Paul Beckwith, who's on Facebook, you can find him here, his own channel on YouTube, he does a hell of a lot of work on it. Paul thinks that we're gonna to go to something like 10C on this planet. <coughs> four C's, four C is an extinction event, and he thinks we're gonna head for 10. The, question, the only question is now, is not is all this gonna happen, but how soon it will happen. There are two scientists who, who work at the uh, University of Alaska in Fairbanks, at, one of them is Natalia Shakova. She has a fantastic presentation on YouTube that was filmed by a guy called Nick Breeze. And her colleague is Igor Similitov. And they are hypothesizing that we could have a 50 gigaton discharge of methane <coughs> from the Arctic clathrates. In the Arctic, there are two different places where the methane is stored. On the land, it is frozen in the permafrost. A feedback loop from the permafrost is, as, it, as we heat the atmosphere, the permafrost melts, it releases the methane. Methane is 26 to 100 times worse than carbon. Another really terrifying thought about the methane 
is that carbon, there's this 10 to 30 year lag between when we let it out into the atmosphere